And we're going to let you ask questions of each other. So it might turn into girls talk. I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm just going to ask them to share uh, a very interesting example of mating behavior um, that they know of that, you know, which is, might, might be very unusual for all of us. I've made this clear already is that we can do some weird stuff with insects that you can't do with other animals. Um, from a research point of view. So one of my favorite examples of this is the mating behaviors of the crane fly. So you may have seen this before. When I was growing up in New Hampshire, people used to call this a male mosquito. They're not mosquitoes, actually. Um, you know that the big, the big, they have big, huge legs. They, like, it made sense. You know, they don't bite you. They, you know, they're bigger than females. You've probably actually never seen a male mosquito <laughs> because they don't, they don't bother being around. They have big plumous antenna. But, um... What I'm talking about is a crane fly, which you've probably seen before. <laughs> they, have, um, they have a pretty interesting mating behavior. So first of all, what's really important is mate recognition. Most insects have some kind of sophisticated way to recognize that they've encountered another member of their species. And the male will do this by grabbing the ankle, the, the leg of the female. Well, this fly determines species based on the diameter of the female's legs. And they know this because they had offered males um, different wires of different di di diameters. And if it was the right diameter, he would attempt to copulate with that wire. So the next thing that happens in this step is he'll hop on top of the female and she'll kind of protest a little bit and she'll raise legs. And eventually she will, um, you know, grant him access. But the first thing that has to happen is he has to kiss her on the head. And the reason, well, you're going to say gross when I <laughs> say the reason, the, <laughs> which is adorable. He has to kiss her on the head. But the reason we know this is that the scientists that were studying it were removing the head and putting it other places to see if it was an important part of the mating ritual. So he would remove the head of the female, put it on a long stick, and the male would crawl up and kiss the head and go all the way back and copulate. Or it would, they would remove the head and attach it to the anus, and he would copulate with the head hole. So that was an important part of the mating ritual. And it just kind of goes to show that there's a lot more we can do with insect behavior because of these kind of cruel experiments that you cannot do with fish or birds or mammals. You, you could rip their legs off and beat them to death with their own legs. Nobody cares. So, so insects are really cool. And so I'm actually going to give like a, a little insect example. Um, but there are these spiders in Australia called peacock spiders. And I don't know if you guys have seen these videos of these things. Let me get your phone out. Yeah, <laughs> they're, they are on YouTube. There's a whole YouTube channel devoted to peacock spiders. They're smaller than your thumbnail, tiny, tiny little things. But the males have this crazy blue, orange, red colored fan that they like lift up and they display to the female. And he does this like whole little dance while he's doing it. He's got, a lot of them have little white tips on their, their legs. Um, they're, they're swinging the fan back and forth. They're waving their arms around. You know, so this whole series of things trying to convince the female that they're not something they should eat, but that maybe you ought to mate with me instead. Um, and, and people have taken liberties with peacock spiders. And you can find peacock spiders dancing to YMCA. You can find <laughs> peacock, peacock spiders dancing to, you know, with lightsabers. Um, peacock spiders that are, you know, giving gifts, uh, you know, planning for Christmas. So um, peacock spiders, I like showing videos of peacock spiders in my classes. If you haven't seen a video of a peacock spider, you should look it up on, on YouTube. They're really cool. They're cute, and it's really fun. The, the stat that I have is more like 3 to 5% of the mammals, but, you know, definitely less than 10% in terms of uh, monogamous mammals, um, none of which that I could recall from reading include primates, which would include. So in regards to Homo sapiens sapiens, the fact that we have things like social monogamy and things like that in society, 
Are we going against our own evolutionary grain? Is this something that we're sort of fighting? What would be the advantages? I mean, for me, it'd be the fact of being able to go home and not find the door locked to my belongings on the front lawn. Um, well, what were the advantages of having a monogamous relationship for Homo sapiens sapiens, since no other primate seems to do that? Uh, some of the ideas behind monogamy, especially in primates, are, are, are first this idea of, you know, protecting the offspring. So, um, you know, uh, you so w one reason that they might mate multiply is to keep their offspring safe because everybody's confused. But if you are absolutely certain that's your offspring, you're going to defend that offspring and that female, right? So that's one reason what to be monogamous. Uh, another reason to be monogamous is that um, offspring, as as a lot of you probably know, they're expensive, um, and so they take a lot of resources. And maybe it takes so many resources to look after that offspring that you need both both parents in order to raise it successfully. And if you think about like how long you know adolescence is in human beings? It's long, right? Everybody's like, yeah. Evolution um, didn't think yeah. that we were gonna have our kids be on insurance <laughs> yeah, until they were well, 23, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but maybe you still needed both parents available to to feed the offspring, make sure they have enough resources so that they can you know grow up to reproduce themselves. Um, so those were probably like the two two best reasons I can think of. Um, well, um, the monogamous relationships um, in mammals and in primates, um, uh, they mark and they, they coincide with the occurrence of having larger brains. And uh, the reason why we end up having larger brains was that we were able to acquire the extra protein and extra nourishment that we require for our daily functions. And that was made possible because uh, the female is taking care of and bearing the child of the off offspring the male partner is uh, is out um, bringing in the food. So um, <clears throat> your brain cells, uh, the rest of your body, they, they use 20% more, they need 20% more energy than rest of your body. So um, uh, so if you look at the evolutionary um, you know timeline, uh, having larger brains <clears throat> are characteristics of homo sapiens. The homo sapiens, you know, the wise men we are. Um, that coincides with uh, with monogamy. So monogamous relationships are beneficial in many ways, um, despite the fact that they, like as mentioned, they reduce the the reproductive uh, success of uh, of an organism. But then um, um, the two partners they were able to acquire enough resources for their own uh, uh, success uh, and survival as well as for their offspring. Uh, we are worried about uh, the fertility rate of insects as a whole. I mean, I heard an article, I read an article the other day on, from out of Australia that we're looking at a massive die-off of insects, like disastrous in 100 years. And then we're, we're basically cooked at that point. We're done. Uh, so I'm wondering whether that's part of the studies and uh, the, uh, what's going on with that science right now. We don't, we don't know. Um, <laughs> um, so just to give you a little background of how this started, well, I think the first time I heard about it is that a bunch of entomologists noticed uh, they call it like the the windscreen phenomenon that um, you know back in the day if you were driving around during the summertime you had a problem with bugs hitting your car and you just don't see that anymore. So some of some of um, some of the first work came out of Germany and they were looking at 20 or 30 years of malaise trapping. And so the reason that this is really important is malaise malaise traps. Um, capture insects in a passive way and by that i mean accidentally like it's not um, an odor or a visual signal that traps these insects there should be no reason that it should change for whatever reason there's no there's no specific behavior affecting them and they've seen dramatic declines in flying insects um this has affected moths beetles hymenopterans you may have heard about bees being in decline um and it affects bees um equally to all these other flying insects so this is something that's happening um, right now, there's speculation as to why that is. Um, of course, modern agriculture, um, pesticides play a role. Loss of habitat is probably a much, much bigger part of that. So if you think about um, not just loss of resources because you have fewer wild spaces um, or more pollution when it comes to chemicals, but also light pollution. Um, insects, especially flying insects, f spend most of their time flying at night. So light pollution could definitely impact their success as a species. Um, light pollution could also impact their success in overwintering. Um, insects will respond to changes in temperature and day length to get themselves ready for the wintertime. So they'll stop growing eggs, 
they'll um, maybe find places to hide. Um, and that's all triggered by cues that happen before the stress comes. So before it gets really cold, insects will respond to changes in um, day length. But if you have a lot of light pollution, that'll mess it up. And if temperatures are, are warmer, that'll mess it up. So um, there's a lot to look at there. So climate change in, in birds or in insects like that, that link is actually really important. Um, so... Uh, there are a lot of bird species, or well, so I'm not, well, there are a lot. There are a lot of bird species that are coming back earlier. So if you're you're a birder and you've been paying attention to when some migratory species come back, you probably notice that they're they're returning earlier each year. Um, but there are some that are not coming back earlier. They're they're maybe cued more in on day length, and not the temperature. And because they're cued in on day length, they're still coming back at the same time. But because the climate is warmer, the insects are now ahead of the birds. So there aren't these like big bursts of caterpillars that the birds depend on to feed their young um, happening when their young need them the most. So they're, the birds are coming back too late. The caterpillars are already too big. They're not as you know available for the birds. And so it's hurting the reproductive success of the birds. So birds that are, are adapting to climate change or, or showing a change in their behavior relative to the climate, they're coming back earlier, they're doing mostly okay. But the, the ones that are um, coming back later, um, they haven't moved their, their arrival time uh, uh, forward. They're, they're um, hurting in, with their reproductive success, success. Also, aerial insectivores, um, which are birds like uh, tree swallows or barn swallows, the ones you see like swooping out over a field or something, scooping up insects, those are actually in, in pretty significant decline. They're one of the, the, the avian groups that we're most worried about, and it may be related to this overall decline in, in insect numbers, too. With the females that are using visual cues to get a male that has more genetic strength or, um, for their reproduction, do they have like a standard, like you were talking about, you know, the bluebirds, you know, have that red? Do they look for that? Is there a time limit, or do they expand their territory? Or at some point, do they just settle and say, this is <laughs> good enough? <laughs> I think people are not sure how females actually make that decision. So um, there, there's kind of this idea that a female, a female might sample like five males or something like that. And then she's going to go back to the best of those five males that she was able to sample. No, yeah, she's gonna she's gonna pick the best of what she got to look at, but she may not get to look at everybody. So she may not actually get the best guy. Um, There's some birds that have you know, and part of it depends on how long their breeding season is. So you know, if if they're a small songbird, they only have a few months. So she's not gonna be able to be as choosy as say, you know, a, a, a female in the tropics who might be visiting many different males for several weeks looking for the right one. Um, so there are so in the tropics. Males will sometimes set up these things called leks, where you get a bunch of males together and they're all displaying. And they're do so if you have ever seen videos of mannequins, these are male birds. They have these crazy colors. The males get on branches and they do these little dances for the female. Sometimes they have to get another male to help them do the dance. Um, and when they do these dances, you know the female can can basically come over, look at them. They, she watches somebody dance. She can go look at somebody else dance, and she she may do this for weeks before she decides who she's going to mate with. Of all the guys she looks at, they're the the best guy in that that lek. He's probably going to get most of the matings from all of the females in the area. So if she's got time, she, you know the, you can see very high consistency in what females want in some cases. So one guy can get like ninety percent of the matings. Um, so there are definitely times when females can be choosy, but there are, there are going to be times when, uh, you know, I don't have time. But so maybe that's part of the reason why you have social monogamy, but they're genetically promiscuous, right? I didn't have time. I had to settle and find a territory. Now that I've settled down and I've gotten to look around, I see it, this guy over here. He's a little bit hotter. So I think, you know, yes, I need to, to mate with you to stay on your territory and get you to feed my offspring but I can have a couple of kids with him that are gonna have a little bit better genetics. So males are the ones who really defend a territory, but females will move off territory and go somewhere else. Um, so she might go, pros they call it prospecting. She'll go move around and check out different males on their territories and then maybe think about who she's gonna mate with. I know that most of us work in behavior and if you're talking about uh, isolating specific stimuli that, that trigger behavior, I wanted to bring up super normal stimulus and I'm, I'm sure you guys have a few examples of this. And it's essentially kind of like if you are triggered 
to um, like bigger things. Like there's the sky is the limit in a lot of situations. So you may pick a fake something that that some horrible scientist has offered you. Um, so an example, uh, we use the color, this bright yellow color to trap insects because it's a super normal stimulus of a growing plant tissue. So like growing plants are usually the tastiest plants for plant feeders. So that, that yellow frequency is a super normal stimulus. They're going towards an artificial version that's just an extreme version of something that they're, they're interested in. Um, an example in humans, um, I, I, I don't know if you've heard this one, but um, um, the shape of a woman, so like the, the more curvy a woman is, the wider her hips are. Um, and when a woman kind of shakes her hips back and forth, it's an example of a super normal stimulus where she's um, altering that hip to waist ratio in the mind of whoever's looking at her. So that's why it's more attractive. Um, it's not because she has bigger hips, just your brain's fooling you into doing it. Continue on that, there was a study. <laughs> there was study done on females um, and those were all heterosexual females and they were not, they were not on any kind of pills. And um, they checked their um, um, hormone levels, uh, namely the estrogen. Now, estrogen is uh, the hormone which is associated with, uh, um, uh, with sexual motivation and mood and everything else and all uh, secondary sexual characteristics as well. So they've noticed that the females are, their estrogen level rises when they are, um, they were shown uh, images of men uh, with more masculine features, defined jawline, and uh, <laughs> And uh, more muscle mass as well, because that again is an indication that uh, of uh, reproductive fitness. So, uh, so yeah, visual cues are important, and I always, uh, since I teach chemistry as well, so I always tell students it's all in the chemistry. It's all deep down in your molecular uh, makeup. You know, the the reason why you meet 10, 10 people in in one evening and only connect with uh, one of them. Um, is uh, all behind molecules. So you can blame all your behaviors on hormones, you know. It's like <laughs> your androgens, your testosterone, um, and then your estrogen and your progesterone, uh, blaming on them. A lot of visual cues, particularly invertebrates, um, rely on colors that are red, yellow, and orange. And in part because fish, birds, we can't synthesize the colors red, yellow, and orange. You can only get them from your food. And so that's why oftentimes when you see brightly colored fish and birds and you know, um, you see them with reds and oranges and yellows because that typically is an indication that they're good foragers. But on top of that, again, as Michelle was saying earlier, that you know, those colors are caused by carotenoids, or like beta carotene, for example. You know, they always say if you eat a bunch of carrots, you're gonna look orange. Um, but those are antioxidants, as, as we mostly know, right? And so if an animal, if an individual can satisfy their immune system with the antioxidants and the amount of carotenes and carotenoids that they take in and yet still have enough to have this beautiful red plumage or this beautiful orange you know spot that a fish may have then that's the guy you want right i mean so you know visual signals are really important and if you if you take a step back a lot of them tend to be these red yellows and oranges and and that has you know a very important implication about immune function about the condition of the individual that's um, advertising that um, as well as the individual's capability of foraging each species have their own mating habits and the time that they take for example um, lions may mate for three or four days before um, they split up and and dogs for example will do their trick in a few minutes and then keep going is there any evolutionary reason for all these different habits? Is, or how did they choose among I mean, short population as opposed to a longer mating and all these? Uh, well, we, we did talk about it earlier, but um, with insects, longer mating is a part of mate guarding. So the longer you're mating with somebody, the more likely you are to you know deliver a little bit more of your genetic information and guard her from mating with somebody else if you're currently mating with her. So for insects, that's really where it comes from. Um, 
Um, as far as fish go, because they're external fertilizers, um, generally it, it's pretty quick. So whether, you know, there, there are two different ways that fish will mate. There's group spawns where you'll have hundreds of females and males that aggregate into the same area and they just kind of all go up to the surface and leave a plume of sperm and eggs and just sort of wait for the currents to do their thing. So, you know, you're talking about a matter of seconds. Um, in the examples where I was talking about with the nests, where a male will have a nest, he'll protect, he'll have some parental care. Same thing, though, because it's external fertilization. It happens within, you know, fertilization itself can happen within a matter of seconds. But, for example, the sunfish, which I studied um, for a couple of years, females will hang out in the nest and, you know, maybe spend about an hour um, fertile, sort of laying eggs, courting with the male, trying to figure out if this is where I want to be. And so as far as the fertilization event goes, it's a matter of seconds, but there can be a lot of foreplay leading up to it. So there is foreplay, so if you count foreplay, then sometimes it can last for hours. Um, I guess for birds, you know, a lot of it does have to do with, you know, sperm competition, right? So. Um, the mating itself may last for just a few seconds. You know, it's very fast most of the time, e except for in ducks when it can take a little longer, but um, they, they'll mate frequently to try to make sure that their sperm is the one that, that is most prevalent to, in case she does like mate with the neighbor. You know, maybe she only gets to mate with the neighbor once, but she mated with the male on the territory many times. So, um, uh, so that aspect of it, I guess, is that she'll, you know, it, I think most of it has to do with sperm competition for the birds too. Okay, talking about birds, I think you uh, indicated earlier they don't have a penis. How do they indeed get anything done? Um, so when, when birds mate, it's called a cloacal kiss, uh, which sounds very nice, right? Um, so um, it, it really just has to do, so the female has to have decided that she's going to mate with that male um, in most birds. Uh, and they don't have... They just have a cloaca, so it's a common opening for all, you know, reproduction, for their urinary tract, for their um, um, digestive tract. So everything comes out the same hole. Um, but it, they just very briefly, the female has to orient her tail in a certain way so that the male can get his cloaca under there. And they, they touch briefly, he releases his sperm, and then it can enter the female. Um, ducks actually, some duck species actually have, you know, when you think about things that are aquatic, that's not going to work as well. So they actually have a piece of tissue. It's not, uh, you know, a penis per se, but something very similar that they can actually insert into the female. Ugly. <laughs> Ugly. I haven't actually seen one. First of all, you're all delightful. Um, question about bugs uh, first. So. If memory serves from my childhood, the praying mantis, you knew this was coming, right? The praying mantis <laughs> kills its mate, right? And maybe the black widow, a uh, horrible movie, but great insect. Um, is that true? Are there other insects that do that? And are there other species who uh, kill the mother or the father along the way after? You it, know? It's absolutely true, but I wouldn't say it's a sex thing, you know? <laughs> A kink. Um, those insects are predators, um, and they'll eat anything that looks like something to eat. Um, they'll respond to the movement of anything that looks like something to eat, and if it happens to be uh, the male that she just mated with, so be it. Um, <laughs> um, but what it does is is contribute to her nutrition and her success and in, in, in the success of her offspring. I will offer you. Um, maybe a sweeter story when it comes to um, nuptial gift. I'm sure other people will talk about nuptial gifts a bit. But uh, the idea of this is that the male would offer the female something to eat um, during the, the courting. So, you know. However, there's a, there's a species of fly called the blowfly. Um, and there's, there's actually several species of flies in this group, and they all kind of do this in a similar way. So the more rudimentary version of it is the fly would, a male fly would offer the female um, another smaller fly to eat. Well, well, he, you know, delivers his compliment. And um, it kind of, dis it distracts her, it gives her something to eat. Um, and then the next stage in that evolution is that he'll actually wrap it up in, in like kind of like a little package. 
Um, and it'll take her a little bit longer to unwrap the, the nuptial gift and it'll distract her longer <laughs> while he's doing what he's doing. Um, and then the next step of that is he eats the little fly and he just gives her the package. Um, and that has developed into some, this, this really um, ritualistic, they, they pass the little ball off in flight. Um, it's part of their mating ritual. So maybe a little bit sweeter story than eating your mate. Most, most birds, you know, um, the males, you know, they don't even have a penis, right? So if you see birds mate, most of the time it's like two seconds and it's done. Um, and he kind of like hops on her back. She has to assume a certain position, and he can he can mate with her. The ones I, I've seen are more like he, you know, to get her to mate with him in the first place or settle on his territory, he might offer her some food. Um, I've I've also seen like my prothonotary warblers. The males will do this cute little thing where he like show he's taking her on a tour of his territory. And he shows her his nest box that I've put out there for him. He hops on top of the nest box. He's got a little piece of nesting material in his box, and he's doing his little song. And he actually dances around too. So he's like spreads out his tail feathers. He sings and has nesting material. He's like, aren't you excited to build your nest in here? And so um, I, I have seen that. It's, it's very cute. Next question is over here on your left. Regarding, I guess, birds and um, going back to even more ancient ancestors, dinosaurs, realizing that they're no longer just all reptiles, but they've evolved into the, uh, into the bird family like that. Um, since you can't do a direct observation of dinosaurs, are they using anything from birds and observations there and patterns there to determine how things happened um, prehistorically? If you look at a phylogeny of like, uh, that includes dinosaurs, birds, and also crocodiles, because crocodiles and birds are, uh, at least now that they're a lot, you know, the, the closest living ancestors, or closest currently living um, relatives of each other, with, bir with di some of the dinosaurs being in between them. So if you look at birds and you look at crocodiles, you can ask, well, you know, the common ancestor of all these things probably did something very similar to what birds and crocodiles do. So you can think about, like, uh, birds and, and crocodiles are alligators, they both build nests, and they both show levels of parental care. So we know from that sort of information that um, this is probably something also that a lot of dinosaurs did is they built belt nests and they showed parental care. And so we've actually reinterpreted some of the fossil findings that we've had in the in the past where we thought this, this um, dinosaur was probably some sort of egg predator. It was uh, specialized on feeding on dinosaur nests and realized that, well, that probably wasn't actually the case. It was probably actually a parent that was by the nest guarding the eggs, guarding the, the young, you know, potentially providing care. Um, some other cool stuff that people have been doing lately actually is um, you can tell what color a feather is by looking at um, electron microscope pictures of the feather. So by like cutting the feather and looking at it in very close detail. And so what scientists have been doing is they can actually take a fossilized feather and they can cut it and look at it and they can they can estimate like what the co what colors the dinosaurs had because the dinosaurs also had feathers. Many of them were feathered. So that's one of the reasons, ways we know that they were closely related to birds. Um, and so if you look at those electron microscope pictures, you can see and, and figure out what color they were. And some of these feathers that the dinosaurs had, you know, there are some things like Archaeopteryx, which was obviously uh, an animal that was, you know, between a bird and a, and a reptile and, and could fly and was using those feathers at least in part for flight. But there are a lot of other dinosaurs that have feathers, but they, there's no way they were flying with them. And one of the things they think they were actually doing was signaling. They were signaling their quality to potential mates. They were signaling to rivals, you know, their quality. And, and now we, that we have this like, information about the color, we can kind of start putting together that dinosaurs probably weren't all green and brown. They probably really varied a lot in color. Yeah. So your homework is to use coical kiss in the sentence. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, please join me in thanking our exceptional panel. Well, the homework besides the coical kiss is that watch Scent of a Woman. Watch that movie. And look at peacock spiders. Yeah. It's all in the chemistry. Okay. Scent of a woman. There you go. Now, we will be bringing them back for halftime entertainment in the future. 